Well, I think it's good to acknowledge that this is Labor Day weekend, the Lord's Day on Labor Day. Uh, we know that some folks are having a last little hurrah of time away, and that's great. A um, little end of summer outing before the super busy fall stuff has happened. But I know here in this region, unlike where I came from in California, school's already been going for a month, right? You've already, you're already busy, right? Busyness has already happened. But even though it's already happened, it is a good time to get a little break, to take some time to, to get together, maybe, maybe grill out a little bit, uh, maybe get in the water. I could, I could enjoy that. It's also a day to acknowledge, not just that it's a day off, but it's a day to acknowledge the, the work of, of working men and women who, who do a lot of the things that make this country go. They make things work. They do fabrication. They do building. They do maintaining. They do operating, they do manufacturing, they do repairing. And to that, we want to say thank you. We are grateful for those who do those works that help us go. We want to honor you. The passage that we're digging into today, no pun intended, is intended to actually focus a little bit on that. We, we want to connect what God has said about our labor, and I believe it's going to bring you great encouragement. I believe that you will come away today with great encouragement in your work, no matter what line of work that you have done or that you may eventually do or that you are doing now. And it's about abounding in the work of the Lord. So I want to read the text for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which as you know, is all about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 is the place to go. Unless you read in the Gospels how it happened, the significance of it is all packed into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 15, and I'm going to read to you from the English Standard Version. Please attend to God's holy and true and life-giving word as I read it to you now. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 through 58. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but... We shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, as we've read this word, this great encouragement about the resurrection flowing from the resurrection and what it means for us, eventually our own resurrection, our own coming immortality, our coming imperishability, I pray that you would help us see today that it's not just about then, but it's about now. May we take encouragement from your word for this day, for this week ahead, in the context of what it means to rest from our labors, to honor those who labor. May we see what it means to abound in your work, in the labor of the Lord. Teach us this through your holy word, by the power of your spirit, open our ears, Open our eyes that we may see and hear and follow Jesus as you desire for us. In Christ's name, amen. So here's a little two-point outline for you. Uh, first point is, uh, you can't do it. He has done it. You can't do it. He has done it. And the second point is kind of like it. It says, you can do something. But what you're doing, he, he's still the one doing it, okay? So let's look at the first one. This, this is a passage about the future, all right? It's about something that's been promised to us in the future, and it's built on the truth of the past, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Christ is risen. Wait, 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 let's try that again. I think my microphone is not, not loud enough. Christ is risen. 
It sounds like you're almost happy about that. Christ is risen. He is risen Amen. That's not just for Easter, folks. That's every time you open the word. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. That's not a fantasy. It's not a story that we like to pretend. It's the truth, and it affects everything about our lives. He is risen indeed. And this word that we are reading today brings us comfort not only about our future resurrection, our resurrection, but also comfort now as we serve him as our God and King. Because we're talking about abounding in the work of the Lord now. And, and that may sound like work to you, and it is. Abounding in the work of the Lord is work. It's talking about work. It uses the word for work. The word translated from the Greek is work. It's work, okay? It is called labor, our labor in the Lord. It's work. So let's look at this passage, and let's work on it together, can we? So the, the encouragement I want to give you is you can't do it. But he has done it, okay? And before you say, hey, Pastor Brad, if you want to give me encouragement, don't say I can't do it. Don't say that. That's not encouragement. Encouragement is more like, you can do it. You can do it. Get out there. That's encouragement, right? We need to look at what he has already done. If we don't look at what he has done, we will think that this is mostly up to us. And as we look at what he's done, we're going to realize that we are recipients of promises and treasures that we could never get without him. He has done it. So look, I'm going to, I'm going to take this verse by verse. I'm going to spend most of my time on the first verse and the last verse. But I want you to see what he has done and how that means you can't do it, but he has done it. Okay? Look at this together. Verse 50 says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. That's not me saying you can't do it. That's him saying you can't do it. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, okay? So we are now, currently, presently, in this moment, embodied flesh and blood. And try as we might, we cannot accomplish this on our own. We can't do it. Flesh and blood, as we now are, which is temporary, amen, hallelujah, must become something different, or we're not going to be able to receive what's been prom promised, which is eternal. We are temporary. The promise we've been given is eternal, his kingdom is forever, like the last line of Mighty Fortress is our God. His kingdom is forever. If we're going to inherit that, we have to be there forever, right? We can't inherit it in the flesh and blood. Also notice, it's not only impossible in us, it's an inheritance. It's an inheritance. What does that imply? It implies it's not a paycheck. It's not a reward for crossing the finish line first. It's not a grade on an exam. It's not a prize that you somehow deserved. It's not a promotion for work well done. It's unearned. An inheritance is not something you earn, right? It's something that has to be designated by the, the owner for the heir, right? It has to be something that's given or granted or promised. And we see this too. An inheritance implies a family connection. And we can't become God's family without God drawing us into his family through adoption, right? And, and then in verse 50, also in verse 58, it's a family connection where, he, where Paul is talking about brothers, brothers and sisters, okay? We are family. It's not something we can do on our own. It's something that we are brought into by his work. See also, it is a kingdom. Whose kingdom is it? Do you see it there? It's God's kingdom. It's God's kingdom. We don't demand our right of citizenship because we've passed an exam or paid our entrance fee. He brings us into his kingdom, and he is the king. He gets to decide. It's not my kingdom. I have no right to this on my own. I, at best, I am a subject, a servant. I'm here at the invitation of the king on his terms, not mine. Okay, so far, we can't do this on our own. Notice also, it is imperishable. What does that mean? That means that nothing can make it go away or weaken or falter or fade. It's not going to go stale. But if you and I, as flesh and blood, are perishable, check the expiration date, right? It's, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's coming up. <laughs> Eventually, we're going to expire, right? If we're going to receive something that's imperishable, we have to be made different. We can't receive it otherwise. So let me ask you the question. I've said it's an encouragement to know that you can't do it. So what did you do 
to be eligible for an inheritance? What did you do to be available to, to come to the king? What did you do to be imperishable? What, what, did you, what can you do, what can you inherit as flesh and blood? You can't do it. So the, the invitation to you is to believe on Jesus because he has done it. To receive the inheritance fully, we're going to have to be born again. And by the way, we will need to die in the Lord, having put our faith in Jesus Christ. And does that remind you, folks, of a seed that falls to the ground and dies and then rises, brings new life, and bears much fruit? So, so far, you can't do it. But look some more at what he's done. He's told us we can't do it. Flesh and blood can't do this. But what has he done? Okay, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery, Paul says. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, which is a great inscription to put outside the church nursery, right? Don't you think that would be great? No. It's a mystery. What does that mean? Is it like Agatha Christie and we you know, kind of got to the last page before you find out who done it? No, a mystery is just something that was hidden, but in the New Testament, it's revealed. It's being revealed to you. It's not every detail. It's not every question answered, okay? But it is something that is unfolded. So when it says a mystery, it's not like totally hidden. You'll never know it. You'll never understand it. He's saying, basically, I'm explaining it to you right here. I'm telling you, I'm telling you the answer. I'm showing you the answer key in the back. He says, I tell you a mystery. Here's what's going to happen. We're not all going to die. And what he's talking about in the future, when Christ comes back, some people will still be alive when Christ returns, and they will be transformed but also the dead will be raised incorruptible. The dead will rise first, and then those who are left alive will be changed. That's what Paul is trying to explain here. So he's revealing this mystery. Okay, it's no longer hidden. And this mystery is not, not yet fully revealed, but it will be. We don't know fully uh, what those who are still alive are going to be like when Christ returns. But one thing we can see is that something's going to happen to us right? It's not like if you make it through the, the workout program that I've laid out for you and you, you, know, you get all buff, you can finally enter God's kingdom. It's not something that you have to put yourself on a particular kind of diet that if you follow it strictly, God will bring you into the kingdom. It's something he's going to do to you. He's going to transform us somehow, okay? We're not really told here in this passage to do anything that's going to make that happen. We are recipients we receive it, okay? And it says some will sleep. He says we will not all sleep, but, it's, but that means some will sleep. And what does that mean? Well, that means die, okay? Some are going to be alive when Christ returns. But sleep here is meant to describe physical death. Like when Jesus was talking about Lazarus, right? I, I want to go to Lazarus. He tells his disciples because he's fallen asleep. And they say, well, if he's fallen asleep, he'll get better and he'll, he'll get well, right? And he's, Jesus is like, no, he's dead right? I, I meant sleep. It's, it's really death. But for Christians, it's kind of like sleep, isn't it? We don't stay dead. It's kind of like sleep, okay? That's kind of exciting. So he says he's using the word sleep, and it means, if you translate it from the Greek, it means sleep, okay? But it also it can be used to describe death, okay? He means dead, but this is really kind of like sleep. Um, we shall all be changed, we shall all be changed. And he does this for you, to you, while you're sleeping. What can you do while you're sleeping except just maybe, maybe snore? I don't know, toss and turn? You can't accomplish anything while you're sleeping. But the whole idea of this happening to you when you're asleep, doesn't that remind you a little bit of like Adam? Like God said, I'll, I'll make a helper for you. So what does he do? Adam, here's what you need to do. You need to fill out this thing and work these things and build this and put these together and gather these materials. No, he puts him to sleep. And then he takes something from him and makes woman and gives it to him. He's asleep, okay? You, Adam, you can't do this. There's no, there's no helper suitable for you. I got this. I'm going to make something so great it's going to blow you away. Amen, ladies. Awesome. Way to go, God. He did it for Adam while he was asleep, okay? God does amazing things while we're sleeping. So what, so far, what are we doing? What do we have to do here to be changed? We have to sleep. We have to die. We don't have to do anything. We just believe on Jesus, right? And he does everything. How quickly does he change us? It says in a moment, verse 52, 
It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. In a blink. It's going to happen to those who are in Christ quickly. It's not something you work up to because you're dead. All right? And it's at the last trumpet. Think of this. Which one of you, did anyone here bring the trumpet part? Does anybody, did we get the trumpet music? No? No? No one has the trumpet music. Okay. Why is that? Because we don't, we don't blow the trumpet, right? In fact, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, it's God's trumpet. The trumpet of the Lord. And here again, look, this, I love this. This is the kind of stuff you get to do when you prepare a sermon, is you get to find all this wonderful stuff and th throw half of it away because it would take too long to show it to you. But I just love this. In Isaiah chapter 27, you can write it down if you're taking notes. I'd love for you to go look at this. This, this last trumpet, is, is, it's, it's sounding the jubilee year of harvest. What is that? The jubilee year is like the 49th year. Seven is, is a special number, like Sabbath. So it's the Sabbath of Sabbath. It's the seventh seventh, okay, of, of years. All right? And what happens in the jubilee year? This time, what, what, what God is doing is he's blowing a trumpet not to harvest crops. He's harvesting people that, that have been in the ground. Isn't that awesome? And, and what else is significant about the Jubilee year of harvest? In, in the Jubilee year, that, that, that last year of harvest, the, the, the people of Israel are told, don't plant any seeds that year. That harvest is something God is going to do without you planting anything. You can't do the Jubilee year harvest. That's God's. Yes, there's work to do for 49 years, but in that 50th year, he's going to, I got something he wants to show you, right? And I'm going to blow a trumpet and it's going to come out that God planted it, and you just get to reap it. Isn't that beautiful? Again, we don't do it. God did it. He plants, and then he summons his resurrection harvest to worship him with his trumpet. I love that. So, so far, what have you done to be raised? You can't do it. He's done it. So far, are you getting the idea? Verse 53, this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. So the perishable body, that's, that's our human flesh, right? Everybody has one. Raise your hand if you have a human body. Okay, yeah, good. Most of you have human bodies. That's excellent. Okay. And it's got an expiration date on it, like cottage cheese, you know? Oh, right? You have an expiration date. I don't know what that is. I don't want to tell you what it is. I don't know what it is. I don't know what mine is, but you got an expiration date. Everybody does. It's perishable, okay? And that's a problem for every single person who would be a mortal, right? Maybe your legacy will outlive you, maybe, but you're still gone. Uh, Woody Allen, was, he's a filmmaker. You guys know Woody Allen. He, he was asked once, you know, how, how do you feel like, like, would you like to achieve immortality through your work? He says, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality by not dying, uh, that's, that's, that's very Woody Allen-esque. It's possible to invest your life in something and make it really something special and significant so that your name is actually written in the history book or you've got your, your name on a plaque somewhere, but you're still dead. And that's, that's actually good news for us because now we're not responsible for immor our immortality. We're not responsible for being imperishable. That's something that God will do for us. We can't do it. He has done it. Maybe, maybe you've heard of... Uh, What's it? Resveratrol, right? That's something in red wine, and they're, they're saying, hey, it has, like, anti-aging properties, right? If you think that's why I'm looking a lot younger, that's not, not my plan is to drink a lot of red wine. But, but if they're harvesting this resveratrol and they find a way to make it into a capsule form, what does that do for us? Maybe it would make us live another 20 years. We're still dead. Or, or how about cryogenics, right? You've heard about that, like people, wealthy people who can spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to have themselves put into a deep freeze and then maybe they'll be thawed out and stuck in a microwave or something. I don't know, to, to, to come back to life or something when they have a cure for whatever their affliction was that caused them to die in the first place. You're, you're still finite. You can't live eternally through resveratrol or through cryogenics or through exercise or through good diet. You can live longer by making wise choices and not getting into a car accident, but you can't live forever on your own. You can't do it, right? Verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 
Do, do you have a role in swallowing up death? I think we have a role in being swallowed by death. It just tastes us, doesn't it? We don't, we don't fight it. We can't beat it. Do you in, contribute in some way to Christ obtaining his victory over death? Jesus has defeated sin and death for all who believe forever, and no one can do that without him, right? So you can't do it, but he's done it. So, so what do we contribute? Is there, is there something in here that we, we do, we do do? Uh, verse 56, this may not be encouraging to you, but it's true. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. The law shows us that we cannot live up to it and that we deserve the punishment that's laid out in it. And that's for you and me and every living human. The problem is sin. Finally, something we contribute. This is our part. We sin. We bring corruption upon ourselves. We live out the consequences of the fall. Do you, do you know Romans 6.23? Some of you probably do. I'll help you with it. The wages of sin is? That's right. That's what we contribute. That's our part in bringing about this corruption into immortality. We bring the corruption part. That's what we earn. That's what we deserve. That's what we merit. That's what we earn. We've achieved something. It's not good. But there's another half of that verse, isn't there? The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin, what we deserve, what we bring, what we get, death. The gift of God, which we don't deserve, which we don't earn, which we could not earn, but which is given to us as a gift, is eternal life in Christ Jesus. You can't do it. He has done it. And now, in verse 57, there's a great big sigh of relief. Look at it. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We, without him, we're dead. But what he gives us is victory. Victory. How do we get this victory? Well, it says it right there. It's given to us. It's given to us. He earned it, Jesus Christ, the Lord, and you can't do it, and he has done it. So now, now finally, verse 58, there is actually something we can do. There's actually a command. There's actually an instruction. So let's take a look at that. Let's spend the rest of our time, point two, talking about that. You can do something, but he's still the one doing it, okay? You can participate, but he's still the one doing it. Verse 58, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. So that's something we can do. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, something we can do. Knowing in the Lord that your labor is not in vain, something we can think, all right? Um, the first word, therefore, means all that stuff we were just talking about from verses 50 on down is, is the basis for believing what is being asked in verse 58 is really possible. Because all that stuff that he's already done, verses 50 through 57, means in verse 58, now you can do something. Before, you couldn't do it. Couldn't put on immortality. Now he's saying, but you can do this. Therefore. The first thing I want you to see in that verse, the most important thing that I want you to see it's not the most important thing. There's so many important things. Nothing can be the most important. But I want you to see this. It says, my beloved. Now, if we put those words in the Apostle Paul, he's saying, he's writing to the church in Corinth, and we're putting that in a time capsule and saying, that was for Corinth. But we're bringing this verse to us today. And so I'm going to tell you, you are loved. You are loved by the God of the universe who made you and who saves you and who wants to walk with you and gives you gifts and invites you to use them for his glory and gathers you into worship and feeds you from the flesh and blood of his own body. Jesus Christ the Lord loves you. You are beloved because of what he has done for you. And that's all of us. All of us who've put our faith in Christ, we are beloved. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. You're part of a family. That's how we get that inheritance. It's a family inheritance, okay? What does he tell us then as beloved brothers and sisters? He says, be steadfast, okay? We're supposed to stand firm. But if you look at that word, it, another way to look at that word, steadfast, means to rest, 
okay? It actually can be, it actually can be remain seated. Be steadfast doesn't just mean stand against the hurricane, right? Put up your shield and your sword and don't let them get past you. It's, it can also be said, just stay there. Remain seated, please. Be steadfast right where you are. What does that mean? That means if you're a Christian, don't change your status. It's a way to hold firm in resistance to lies or resistance to temptation, which we sang about, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. It's also hanging on to what is true, believing what is true and acting on it, not shifting from the hope of the gospel like we read in Colossians 1. Don't shift from the hope of the gospel. There's no other hope out there. Don't think you can do it. Don't think anybody else has got a better story, okay? Continue in the faith, brothers and sisters. And then he says, always abounding, which, which also can be translated, give yourselves fully. Give yourselves fully. He's given you the victory. Give yourself fully. You can never give in order to match what God has already given for you. you you'll always be in his debt if you compare things in an accounting kind of way. All right? But what Paul is saying is, because of what he's given to you, he's already given you the victory. Give yourself fully to him. There's no greater use for a human life than to devote it to the service of the Lord in whatever capacity he's called you. Okay. Give yourselves fully. That's all of you, all the time. Give yourself, all of you, fully, all the time. Always abounding. And that's the Lord's work. So what does that look like? What, is that, what does that look like? Well, it can take as many shapes as there are bodies in the room, okay? Um, when I was going over this message with Robin, we, we, um, we recalled a, an event in our, in our past when we were camping, and um, we were at this campground, and it was, it was one of those nicer campgrounds that had flush toilets, so that was kind of nice. And we just happened to be in the campground area over near where this restroom was, and this gigantic pump truck came into the campground. I think you know where I'm going with this. Huge truck. I mean, it was bigger than one of the little home septic suck-out system things. And the guy came up to the, to the campground bathroom, which has got to be a place you don't want to visit unless you have to. And he got out of the truck, and we just happened to notice him, and he looked over at us and, you know, hey, how you doing? Nice day. And he's like, oh, it's a fantastic day. It's a beautiful day in the Lord. Don't you just love this place? Isn't it gorgeous? Look what he's made. And we're like, wow, this guy's kind of on fire. What's going on with him? And he proceeded to take this gigantic hose out of his truck, you know, and put it where you don't want to think about it. And I, do, I want to tell the story, but I really don't want to give you any details because it was not pleasant. It's not something you want to think about. And yet he does that all the time. That's his job. And he was loving God in that moment. That's abounding in the work of the Lord. In fact, that was, I don't know, some decades ago, probably before we even had kids. I think we were trying to remember when it was. So probably 30 plus years ago, more than that. And he was giving glory to God, abounding in the work of the Lord back then. And his story is in front of you right now that you would give glory to God. Look how the benefits of what he has done and said, just in that little moment, not even thinking about it. He didn't say, write this down and talk about it 30 years from now. But it's still having an impact to bring glory to God, how someone can always abound in the work of the Lord, no matter what you do, even if you pump out septics in a campground for a living every day of your life. That's a way that y'all, we all, can abound in the work of the Lord. He was abounding in the work of the Lord. He was full of joy, and he was rightfully aware of the favor of God on his life. That's the Lord's work. That's not the only work, but that definitely is bringing glory to God even now as we talk. And then Paul says something that should just absolutely make you float out of here. He says, this is how we're to do this work of the Lord. The attitude we have to have to face whatever we face. He says, knowing that your labor, that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. That is the clincher for me. That's the clincher. Can you receive that? That's the massive encouragement that I can give you today. That's the massive comfort from God's word today. God, who is sovereign over all, can guarantee that your labor in him is not in vain. He guarantees it. Whatever you do in the Lord, it's not in vain. If you don't see a result 
I have given my life to this thing and I don't see any progress at all. It's not in vain. I've tried and tried and tried with this person. I've shared the gospel with them. I don't know how many times they've rejected me. They've rejected Christ. They speak ill of him. Lord, am I worthless? Am I so bad at this? It's not in vain. Your labor in the Lord, God says, is not in vain. But, but, my, but my marriage, I struggle and, and I, I have these problems and we can't seem to get around it and I'm trying to do what you say, Lord, and it just doesn't seem to be making a difference. It's not in vain. My child, I, I try with my child and I just don't see any progress and they don't seem to want anything to do with Jesus and they're not even, they're not even here and I'd want them to be with us and they're not here. Your labor is not in vain. Are you praying for them? Are you loving them? Are you giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord? If you don't see anything as a result at all of your work, it's not in vain. He can guarantee it. He's sovereign. He makes the promise. When you work in the Lord, it's not in vain. Ever. Never. Take that as an encouragement to continue to abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Remember verse 57, it says he gives the victory. It's not on the slide. You, you run the race in Christ, he says, and you win. Who can guarantee that? God can. He's done everything else as he promised. He's promised the, the fulfillment of, of imperishable, immortal, okay? He can do it. He raised Jesus from the dead. He can do it. And you can abound always in the work of the Lord. You can do something, and he's still doing it. He's still ensuring your victory. He's still harvesting souls. He's still maturing believers. He's still convicting sinners. He's still drawing the lost to come to him. He's still bringing a saving knowledge of Christ to people all around you. Sometimes it's just because of the way you treat them. Other times it's because you share the direct gospel message with them. You invite them to a Bible study. You invite them to study the Bible with you. You invite them to church. You invite them to your small group. You just go out for a drink with them. You love people. It's not in vain. So let's get a little bit more practical as we finish up here. What might that abounding in the work of the Lord look like for you? Well, for today, just, just a couple things. The first is a, just, they're mostly just ways of thinking, not really something you have to go out and do, pick up your shovel and work at it. And if these translate into actions, that's great. But if it's in here, it's going to come out in your hands. All right. So here's the application. First, I want you to think of yourself and everyone else around you as an immortal being. C.S. Lewis made this observation in his, in his essay, The Weight of Glory, about the fact that everybody's going to live forever. Some are going to live with Christ, and some are going to live in torment. Everyone's going to live forever, but where? With whom? This is what he said. He said, it's a serious thing to remember the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature, which, if you saw it now, you may be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, at, if at all, only in nightmares. He says, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. The flesh and blood will have to die. We will all be raised, some to eternal judgment and corruption, and some to eternal life with Christ. So first, practice thinking of people around you as immortal. Next, a few other thoughts. And I want you to think about thought replacement here. This is, I'm just going to run through these. If this hits you, grab it and stick it in there, okay? If you're tempted to think, I may not make it to heaven, what you need to think is, I, can, I can't do this, but he's already done it for me. I'm just going to believe in him. If you're tempted to think, my life is not going to count for anything, I want you to think, my labor in the Lord is not in vain. If you're tempted to think, I'm not good enough, what I want you to think is, he's all the good I need. Okay, like that you were, you were alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. He's made you holy and above reproach and blameless, all right? He didn't save you because you're good. He saved you because he's good. If you're tempted to think, I don't have what it takes to do God's work, think he calls me to abound and he gives me the victory. If you're, if you're tempted to think, I don't... I don't do the Lord's work. That's only professionals, right? I, I want you to think it's, it's his work and it's for all that he calls and all that he saves. 
If you're tempted to think, my situation is just too hard. It, it's been this way for too long. I want you to think he's done all the work for me and eternity is not that far off. If you're tempted to think it's too late, I'm too weak, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm too busy, I'm too sinful, it's not the right time for me, I want you to think, right, all that's true. That's why I need a savior. And I have one. And my labor is not in vain. He tells me to abound, I'll abound. And he's the one working. Let him do it. What we need to do here is understand and believe and accept that all that verse 50 through 57, the first part of all that he's done for us, it's all done. The Christian life is not do, 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 do. It's done, 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 done. He has done the work for you. So when you come here early and you set up the sound system and you run the slides, you're participating in the work of the Lord to help us communicate the message of reconciliation between God and man. When you greet people at the door as they come into worship, you are communicating the love of God, modeling the grace of acceptance and welcome to all who come to Christ. When you lead a community group or a Bible study, when you serve in the nursery, when you manage the Grace Church website or you, the church directory, when you make the coffee or you clean up after a spill, you're abounding in the work of the Lord to show that God and people are reconciled. There is love here for all who are in Christ Jesus. We want you to be whole and loved. And if you're a visitor today, we, we hope that you have seen and felt the love of God through Christ, through the people of Grace Church. We're very glad that you're here and we want you to feel that when you come again. If you're a member or a regular attender, today on this Lord's Day of Labor Day weekend, it's a day to rest in the finished work of Christ for your salvation. Be steadfast, immovable, never shifting from that hope of the gospel, and at the same time, this day and every day is a day to abound in the work of the Lord. Sowing seeds of gospel grace, always giving yourselves fully knowing, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let's pray. How good you are, O oh God, to give us the victory. Help us to know what to do with it. Help us to know how to apply what we've heard. Take us from a place of fear. Take us from a place of doubt. Take us from a place of timidity, reluctance, or maybe just being stuck and move us to the place where we are thinking of ourselves and others as immortal, to conduct our business as the business of heaven, to serve one another as though we are serving Christ, and to trust you for the outcome, knowing that our labor is not in vain. We ask you this today and every day in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.